Hello. So what we're going to talk about now, we're, we're still staying at continental environments, but we're going to now talk about aeolian processes in deposits. So aeolian are wind-blown um, sand set, uh, settings. So the general context of aeolian deposits, um, we have a mountain belt, uh, alluvial fans supplying coarse sediment out of those mountain belts, and then when we're in a, a, an arid or a semi-arid setting, <clears throat> you know, the, the wind can rework the sandy components from the alluvial fans to generate large dune systems. And we can also develop lakes, lakes which can be ephemeral. In other words, they're not present there all the time um, within the basin center. To give you an example of this, a real example of this, here we're looking down at um, an aerial satellite view of uh, um, aeolian deposits in, in California. So, you know, mountains in here, alluvial fans supplying sediment at the margins of the basin, and then some of that sand being reworked by wind to form these aeolian dune systems. There are different types of dunes, uh, depending on their geometry and scale. We'll talk about those um, in the next few slides. Okay, so um, aeolian bed forms, so those are wind-blown ripples and dunes. Um, they occur at different scales. So this graph here shows grain size on the vertical axis, the, uh, the wavelength of the, the bed forms, the, the ripples or dunes on the horizontal axis. And then several um, areas in here which are highlighted as, as being where specific types of aeolian bed form uh, are developed. So the first thing to say is the grain size range here is pretty narrow. It's narrower than in, for example, um, water lane deposits. Uh, effectively, we're looking here at, at sand, um, typically fine, uh, very fine, fine and medium grain sand. The smallest bed forms are ripples. Those tend to have wavelengths of several tens of centimeters and heights of millimeters to centimeters. Aeolian ripples tend to have lower amplitudes, lower heights than uh, water lane ripples. They look as though they've been squashed compared to water lane ripples. Aeolian dunes, so these, these, these can have wavelengths um, in the order typically of tens of meters up to hundreds of meters and heights from 10 centimeters up to tens of meters. So these, are, these can be the same size as water lane dunes, but they also extend it to bigger sizes. This field here, DRA, so these are really enormous aeolian bed forms, heights of over 100 meters and wavelengths of kilometers. So these are, you know, significantly bigger than what you might think of as dunes. These are the kind of bed forms you've probably seen uh, in pictures of the Sahara Desert, the biggest scale of bed forms present there. So here's a, a picture showing that some of that hierarchy of different bed forms. So if you look at the top part of this block diagram, this shows, you know, what we might imagine at the modern land surface. So here we have these very large dra bed forms. Again, wavelengths in the order of a kilometer, heights in the order of 100 meters. Um, they're separated by areas, you know, troughs in between these draws, those are often referred to as interdune areas. That interdune term relates also to small scales too. Superimposed on this large draw, we have smaller scale dunes. And those dunes can have different geometries. We'll, we'll come to those in a minute. The dunes are recorded by individual cross beds in here. And those cross beds are stacked into larger scale sets, which, which correspond to the draw. The interdune areas, they correspond to areas that, that um, as the name suggests, tend to lack large scale cross bedding. And assuming we, we, this is a very sandy system, um, we, we're supplying enough sand to preserve these interdune areas, then they can be laterally continuous. <clears throat> 
if we don't have as much sand available, then there can be some reworking and cannibalization of those deposits and they become less well preserved. Okay, let's move to the geometry of Aeolian dunes. And there are four sort of main categories here, again, each shown in these, um, these block diagrams. So the first type of dunes, the top left in here, these are Barkan dunes. They have a crescent shape and the tips, the points of the crescent, they point in the downwind direction. So uh, these are discontinuous laterally. They record one wind direction. So if you measure, for example, the paley currents based on the, um, the dip in, in the, uh, the downwind side of those dunes, we end up with a range of orientations shown in this rose diagram, a range around the mean value, which is, uh, you know, in the prevailing wind direction. These will be expressed essentially as trough cross beds. We move to the top right and here we're looking at dunes which are also asymmetrical with the steep face facing downwind. But here the crests of the dunes are more continuous laterally. They can be slightly sinuous or straight. Um, again, if we, if we were to use the, the dip of the downwind or the lee face of the dunes, if we use that as a measure of the paley current direction, we'd see that those cluster in one direction around a mean, which is pointing in the prevailing wind direction. These will typically be preserved as tabular cross beds or potentially also trough cross beds with very broad troughs, very extensive troughs. Okay, but still one wind direction. Okay, we now move to more complicated um, dune geometries. And these are often associated with larger scales of dunes. So we can develop linear dunes as the name suggests, these have relatively straight crests. And in cross section, they're more or less symmetrical. So the two sides of these linear dunes have more or less the same dip angle. And these dunes form where we have two wind directions that basically sort of push the, the sand up into, into these linear ridges. So if we use the um, the dip direction of the two sides of the dune, if we take those as approximations for paley current directions, what we would expect to see is paley currents in two clusters, in two directions, and those two directions corresponding to the two prevailing wind directions. Okay, the bottom right here shows a star dune. So if you like, these are each, each arm of the star is like a linear dune, you know, relatively straight and close to symmetrical in cross section. But those, those linear arms meet up together at a central point to form a star. And these are formed where we have a, you know, a big range of wind directions. Um, pairs of wind directions sort of again pile the sand up into these linear arms. Um, but because there's, there's much more variation in the wind direction, we, we build up multiple arms and form the star. If we take the dip directions of these um, arms as the, uh, of the star uh, as an approximation for the paley current directions, what we can see in a rose diagram is that we have a, a very wide range of paley current directions. Okay, th this table summarizes some of these features, again, for Barkan, transverse, linear, and star dunes. So the number of slip faces, those are the number of steep faces in a downwind direction. For Barkan and transverse dunes, we just have one slip face. For linear dunes, we can have typically two slip faces, and we have more than that for star dunes. Um, the scale of those dunes, well, generally bark and, and transverse dunes are small. And as we look at linear and star dunes, we're looking at bigger scale dunes. Bigger scale in terms of height and also in terms of wavelength. Um, in terms of the wind regime, that's really the range of wind directions. Um, basically just one wind direction for bark and transverse dunes. 
two wind directions for linear dunes and lots of wind directions for star dunes. Where we have more than one wind direction, that can be seasonal. So it, those winds do not have to be acting all together at the same time. They can switch through the seasons, for example. Okay, similar grain sizes through here. Again, you know, typically very fine sand to medium sand, although possibly into, into coarse sand in, in, in places. Typically where we have bark and dunes and transverse dunes, um, well, the bark and dunes are isolated. They have a small volume, so that implies a relatively small amount of sand. Transverse dunes require more sand to build up. So that's reflected in the amount of sand we have available from Barkin being limited to abundant in transverse dunes. Something similar for linear and star dunes, although both of those require large volumes of sand to be available to sculpt those large um, features. Barkin and transverse dunes, they tend to record sideways movement down the wind direction. Linear and star dunes tend to also build up vertically. Okay, so let's think now about the processes so um, by which sand is moved over any of these dunes. So the next series of slides apply to all these different types of dunes. They're illustrated really with, for simplicity um, with examples of, um, of Barkin or, or, or transverse dunes. Well, there are three ways that sand is moved over the dune. So the first is, which is shown in the red box here, is that we have ripples, wind ripples migrating over the dune. And we tend to see that more commonly sort of on the, the upwind uh, face of the dune or in the interdune areas. So wind ripples, they're characterized by low relief. So they have a low height compared to subaqueous or underwater dunes. We can also get inverse grading. So within, um, within a wind ripple, we can get coarser grains at the crest and finer grains um, in the, the troughs in between the ripples. They tend to be poorly preserved. Um, that's because other processes dominate on the steeper slip face of the dune. We tend to preserve wind ripples in, in other areas. So where we preserve the stoss side, the upwind side of the um, of the dune, we can preserve them there or in between dunes. Second thing in here are grain fall strata. And these, are, these are, occur in the slip face, the downwind or the lee face of, of a dune. What happens here? Well, basically the wind as it's blowing over the dune, it will pick up sand, usually the finer part of the sand, from this upwind face and it will carry that over to the front of the dune and there it will the velocity will decrease and that finer sand will settle from suspension and cover the entire face of the dune. So by grain fall we're thinking about deposition from suspension as the velocity lowers on the downwind face of a dune and we end up depositing a fine laminate fine a laminate of fine sand all the way over the front of the dune. That's shown in here by these white laminations um, in the front face of the dune here. They're continuous over the full face of the dune, um, potentially more abundant in the lower part of the face. Third type of, of, uh, of process in here, are what's referred to as grain flow strata. So we've said that you know we, we can, the wind can strip off the finer fraction of the sand from here and deposit it on the slip face as a grain fall lamina. That means that we concentrate the coarser sand at the crest of the dune. And these dunes have steep faces and they're, you know, they're close to being stable and unstable. They're close to that, that transition. And Periodically, that, that, that face becomes unstable and we have avalanching of the coarse grains down the front of the dune. And that avalanching is what we refer to as grain flow. So you can see some of those here, these avalanches shown schematically on the front face of the dune. And those are shown in here as these sort of stippled, shaded laminae in here. 
those are so those are coarse and they they occur particularly on the upper the upper part of these faces so one sort of key thing in here if you look at the slip face the, the downwind face of a dune we have this regular alternation between fine sand laminae coarse sand laminae fine sand of the grain flow sorry fine sand of the grain fall coarse sand of the grain flow and that that repeats itself on you know the scale of millimeters to centimeters so let me show you some examples of those so here are some large scale aeolian dunes with some people for scale you can see hopefully this is one large cross bed here the bedding looks parallel these are actually wind ripple deposits in between dunes here's the next dune on top about a meter or so of, of cross bedded sandstone we zoom into one of those cross beds and we look at the laminae within there and what we can see is an alternation uh, of of relatively fine sand in this case with a red color and medium grain sand in this whiter color um, fine sand medium sand this is the alternation between the grain uh, the grain fall the fine sand and the grain flow or avalanche laminae in the white sand here and that's that's a really distinctive characteristic of aeolian dunes we don't see to anything like the same extent in subaqueous or underwater dunes in reservoir terms that's important because those you know fine sand and medium sand have different values particularly of permeability so here you've got a line drawing of a, a section of core with a core plug sample from a Permian Aeolian sandstone reservoir in the Southern North Sea. Um, and here you're seeing basically uh, values of permeability measured at points within uh, different laminae. So you see some of those points measure permeabilities in the order of tens of millidarcies. Those are the medium sands, our grain, um, our grain flow laminae. And then we have finer sands associated with, with permeabilities which are an order of magnitude lower. So about one millidarcy in this case. And that alternation takes place all the way through here. So it has a very significant impact on, on the reservoir properties in aeolian crossbeds. Um, aeolian crossbeds are typically stacked vertically. Um, and you maybe get a sense of that here that uh you know in this case aeolian sands in general can be very well sorted so unless they've been deeply buried and subject to cementation they tend to have high porosity between 10 and sorry between 20 and 30 percent high permeabilities typically hundreds to thousands of millidarcies so the values you're seeing in this example here are probably pretty typical of most aeolian reservoirs you can see you know there's, there's this sort of spiky character to the you know the individual points measured in core plug samples that's because some samples measure you know from the the, the coarser grained laminae some measure from the finer grained laminae that gives rise right to this kind of noisy character in here okay let's think a little bit about sequence stratigraphic models and i'm going to keep this pretty brief so um in in aeolian deposits um sand accumulates well we need to have an abundant supply of sand to accumulate these sandstones um but we also need to preserve those sands and typically it's the water table which um we can think about as the equivalent to sea level in a shallow marine setting if, if the sand is deposited below the water table as thin films of water around the grains that acts to sort of bind the grains together and it stops them being blown off by the wind so the water table is we can think of that as base level or equivalent to, to sea level um, we can get for example if we have dry sand and vigorous uh, wind we can have erosion so we can have accumulations of sand that which are eroding away and we can generate what's referred to as a deflation surface so we blow off any sand which is present above the water table 
those deflation surfaces, well, inevitably there's more than one name to describe those. Why would we do anything simple in geology? So you'll also see the term Stokes surface referred to. That's something you might come across in the literature. Um, once the surface is, is sort of formed, if we have, um, we have no net accumulation of sand, then we have bypass of sediment across that surface. So again, you might find this term bypass supersurface referred to. If the water table rises, what that means is we, we're then adding accommodation space um, to store and preserve aeolian sand. But by raising the water table, we will probably also cause you know, expansion of lakes, for example. A rise in water table might be associated with a wetter climate. So you know, expanded lakes, but also rivers potentially um, being more present uh, and more abundant. Um, and also encroaching into these aeolian dune fields. And you now these supersurfaces, they can be isochronous. They can represent timelines, provided that the controls that form them uh, are, are driven by regional changes, which are changing, regional controls that change through time. And the most common one here um, in terms of water table, that's climate is the obvious control there. Um, but also, you know, tectonic subsidence, that, that's usually in, in pretty much any basin, that's the long-term control on how much accommodation space we develop to preserve any type of sediment. So here we're looking at uh, two schematic cross-sections through a, a, an Aeolian basin. We have a, a mountain belt or a kind of a raised area in here, rivers supplying sediment from that during wet periods. This top diagram is showing a, a kind of a dry period and in here we're seeing basically you know a large aeolian dune field. Off towards the right we have um, the edge of a lake so Sabka is a shoreline at the edge of a lake in an arid setting um, and the lake center is off to the right hand side of this figure. We think about taking that same basin and consider it in, in a wet climatic period. Well, during a wet period, we, we, the, we, these rivers are active, they're actively flushing and moving sediment from the mountain belt, maybe forming an alluvial fan and rivers extending into the basin. Um, we basically shut off sediment supply, uh, aeolian sediment supply, you know, the water table rises and we, we stabilize some of those dunes because they're wet, but the wind can blow away any, any, any kind of loose sand at the surface. And we also have lakes in this case sort of expanding outwards and, and moving towards the basin margin. So lacustrine deposits and sabkas, which are you know, these shorelines at the edges of the lake, they're also moving towards the basin margins. Okay, I, I mentioned these terms sort of deflation surface and bypass surface so let me say a little bit more about those. Uh, I really uh, these two diagrams show really the same kind of thing so probably the, the, the diagram on the on the left is a more important one. The key thing here is that basically the, the bottom um, bold line in here that's basically the position of the water table. Um, we can accumulate sand above that water table, but it's not sand that will be stored there because it's dry. So poor preservation potential. We have to raise the water table to basically you know, preserve the sand in here. And that again is a combination typically of a wet climate and also tectonic subsidence to, to, to create the space. Um, and you know, once that sand is blown off, we can have deflation down to there. We can also have roots, for example, uh, and we can have evidence of non-deposition at those surfaces. So that would include roots, for example. The model on the right is sort of a variation on that theme. Um, I'll, I'll start on this diagram here about halfway down. Here we've raised the water table, so we're going to preserve a section of Aeolian dunes. But it, in this case, we're also associated with, with flooding. So um, these, these blue areas in here are, are ponds or lakes in, in interdune areas. The dunes themselves are, are, can be vegetated. 
so uh, you know and, and any any fine any any material any sand above that aeolian sand above the water table is basically bypassed um across it's blown across by the wind across the surface and it's not preserved so uh, this this is a nice 3d block diagram that captures some of that stratigraphic architecture so typically what we'd expect to see are these deflation surfaces sometimes associated with flooding um, and they form you know they bound the stratigraphic units themselves and in between there we preserve aeolian deposits uh, recording the migration of dunes and dra and other bed forms we can get interdune areas preserved within those packages um, that they're still present their degree of preservation will depend on how much vertical aggradation there was of the dune system as it was also prograding down the wind direction these these deflation surfaces themselves where well, they can be associated with with small well, with, with plants with roots with ephemeral lakes sometimes associated with um, the lakes are associated with um, with cementation uh, the minerals precipitated around the lake can also cause early cementation so here's an example uh, in the field of, of one of these surfaces so we have large cross beds down below these are aeolian, aeolian sands down below above we also have um, aeolian sands and there's a very a very marked change in color just about in here these lower sands are, are partly cemented so again cementation associated with um with the development of of, of shallow ponds at that surface uh, those above are, are poorly cemented or are, are cemented during much later burial so, so less environmental early cementation um, i also said that you know during these during these wet periods we could have for example rivers building out into the dune field so if we look at you know a, a reservoir a small portion maybe a reservoir scale within this basin we have a, a fluvial deposits interbedded with aeolian deposits the fluvial deposits representing the wet periods aeolian deposits representing the dry periods and those are separated by these deflation surfaces so deflation surfaces at basically at the base of the aeolian deposits at the basinwood margin of the dune field we can have expansion of lakes and sapka these lake shoreline deposits and they will also you know we'll see an alternation at a reservoir scale of aeolian uh, sandstones and either lake deposits or sapka deposits and again the base of of the aeolian deposits recording the drying out and um and maybe development of desiccation cracks for example the base of the of the lacustrine deposits recording flooding so here's here's an example um, of, a, of, a, of a lake well at the margin of, of a dune field where it interacts with a lake the the orange sands below in here you can see it's difficult to see bedding in there it looks very disturbed and these these are sabka deposits the reason the bedding is to, is is uh, disturbed there is because there are evaporite minerals precipitated uh, within the sediment um, as the as the lake is as the lake shoreline is developing and that uh, evaporite precipitation destroys a lot of the primary bedding above there in white we have aeolian sandstones cross bedded sandstones the contact between the two we have a surface that represents the change from a wet climate below to a dry climate above and that's characterized by deep desiccation cracks cracks that record the drying out of the sabka and the lake and the sort of cracks developed at the surface through that drying process here's a detail of one of those desiccation cracks you can see it has a wedge shape a downward um, decrease in thickness you can also see they're pretty they're pretty chunky features they're quite robust they're not delicate features they're big robust features again just to sort of make the point that um, at reservoir scale what we tend to see is is some 
zones represented by wet climate of lacustrine deposits, sabka and fluvial deposits around the edges of, a, of um, an aeolian um, sort of dune field. And uh, during the dry periods, we have better development uh, and, and preservation of the um, of the aeolian crossbeds, aeolian sands. Within the lake itself, we can also get evaporite minerals precipitated, particularly during these dry periods. Let me show you um, what some of the fascias look like in core through these different types of, of environments. I'll show you fascias on this slide and then I'll show you surfaces on the next slide. So here we are, this is basically showing you know, poorly sorted um, sandstone including some gravel sized clasts in here. These are uh, fluvial deposits. The, particularly these coarser grains, these are too coarse to be transported by the wind. So in this kind of setting, if you're seeing um, if you're seeing granules and gravel grade material, that's got to be introduced by, by water. The second image in here is through an aeolian dune, an aeolian crossbed. You can see it's nice and clean. There's, you know, it looks well sorted visually from the image you can see there. Um, we can look, for example, we can look at lamination at the bottom and it seems to be almost horizontal and then it gets steeper as we move up through here. That's recording the change from the base of the dune and as we pass higher up the dune, the dune is, is getting steeper. So the dune face is slightly sort of curved. We move from the bottom of the dune and as we pass upwards, the, the dip is getting steeper. You can maybe also see, this is a bit more subtle, but what's allowing you to pick out the bedding in here is this small scale lamination scale variation between fine sand and medium sand. That's between our grain flow, sorry, grain fall and grain flow laminae. Okay, the third piece of core in here is from a sabka. This is one of these lacustrine shorelines. Um, we have a mixture of a fine sand in the paler orange and, and mud and silt in the darker orange. The key thing here is we're seeing, you know, the, the bedding is quite disturbed. Some of that is, is, is bioturbation, but some of it is also precipitation and then dissolution of evaporite minerals within the sabka. And that tends to disturb the primary bedding. The far right in here, we're looking at the you know, deposits in the center of the lake. And here we're seeing, you know, really quite nice, clearly bedded, interbedded sand. Um, so windblown sand blown into the lake and silt in a darker orange. You can also see there are some burrows in here, but predominantly what we're seeing is just nice, uh, sort of nice, clear pinstripe type lamination. Let's look at some surfaces here then. Um, so here we are on the left hand side, we're seeing in the bottom half of this piece of core, a pretty structureless sandstone with some, some, you know, some medium sand grains sort of floating in a matrix of fine sand. These are interpreted to be sabka deposits. We might, we might if we were lucky, actually encounter some uh, evaporite minerals within the core. And they're overlain across a sharp surface by uh, medium and fine sand, where there's an alternation um, between laminae, between medium, fine, medium, fine, medium sand. So these are aeolian sand. This surface here is recording a drying out um, across that surface. The middle piece of core, we have a you know, dark orange mudstone in here and it's it's intersecting this at the edge of a desiccation crack. So this is one of these sand filled cracks called caused by drying out and we can actually see pieces of mudstone which have been kind of which have fallen in from the walls of the crack. Okay the, the image on the right hand side here we're seeing lacustrine uh, mudstones or at least water lane mudstones and, and fine sandstones at the bottom of the slide. The top of the slide, we have well sorted sandstone, so probably aeolian. And we have this thin interval here where we have really some, you know, some coarse sand and maybe uh, granule grains in here. So uh, this is telling us this surface, um, so this, this, this coarser material must have been supplied by rivers. 
but it's concentrated here in a lag. So this probably records, or this, this could potentially record deflation. The wind blowing away the finer part of the fluvial sand and then just concentrating the coarse sand to give it in this thin unit or lag before we then accumulate wind-blown sand above. So this is potentially a candidate for a deflation surface in here. We'd have to correlate it laterally to see if that's really a viable interpretation. Okay, let me say, finish off the last few slides looking at sort of regional to reservoir scale changes. So these, these are three maps showing sort of paleogeographies uh, in a Permian basin in the southern part of the North Sea. So the outline of the southeastern UK in here, London is, is sort of out in the bottom left of this slide for this, this image, this map on the left hand side. And during the Permian in the southern North Sea, we had a, a basin that was, in, it was infilled partly by Aeolian and partly by lacustrine deposits. So this, um, this, this first image here is basically showing sort of a, a, a dry phase within the development of the basin. You can see alluvial fans, but, but really closely tied uh, to the basin margins, a large extensive dune field, and then the lake in front of there, um, including deposition of halite during an, an arid period and sort of drying out of a lake and precipitation of evaporite minerals. The two images on the right, in the center on the right show maps, but really for, um, for more extensive sort of wet periods developed at different times in the stratigraphy of these rocks. So if we look at the center one in here, um, we see during this wet period, um, again, alluvial fans around the margin, but you can actually see there are rivers extending into the basin here and sort of navigating their way through the dune fields. The dune field itself is a bit narrower and the lake is expanded so it extends further to the south uh, and although we still have some evaporation and precipitation of evaporite minerals that's less extensive than during the dry period. Okay so now thinking at reservoir scale typically what we see within a reservoir this is this is one of the um, the sands, these Permian sandstone reservoirs, the Rotligan sandstone reservoir from the southern North Sea. So this, this is basically within the kind of area represented by these maps. The vertical scale in here, uh, this is about, um, about just over 200 meters of vertical, uh, vertical stratigraphy. And what we see in here, we, we see there are some parts of the reservoir associated with low gamma ray, clear separation of, 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 of neutron density, um, indicating sand. Um, and these are interpreted as aeolian dune sands. Okay. And they are alternating with intervals where basically there's, there's, um, there's, there's a crossover, a separation of neutron density in the opposite sense, plus also higher gamma ray. And those are interpreted to be variably lacustrine or sabca or fluvial deposits. Um, so really representing the wetter periods. And we have, a re we have an alternation between the aeolian, clean aeolian sands, the sort of dirty lacustrine or sab uh, fluvial or sabca sands. They alternate and that defines the reservoirs a nation within this reservoir. We look at the same reservoir, um, we, we trace it out laterally, and those those reservoir zones are continuous laterally. So they really define a layer cake uh, sort of style to these reservoirs. So again, sort of you know, relatively simple in reservoir terms, well layered um, layer cake, so easy to correlate, um, and also you know the Aeolian sands themselves typically tend to have very high reservoir quality, clean well sorted, high porosities and high permeabilities. Okay, so let's stop there and we'll move to, to applying this in a practical.